trauma is the mission field of the 21st century. Does that thought stop you in your tracks? It sure does me. I'm Dana Gresh. This is Grounded. And I'm Erin Davis. We're here on a mission to give you hope and perspective. And today's topic can feel pretty hopeless. Every day it seems like there's a new headline about a pastor or an elder or a Christian leader who is being accused of abuse. And what that means is that there is a long trail of women and children and men who are hurting today. You know, Erin, sadly, I know some of those individuals, and Mm. it's been not an easy thing to learn how to walk with them and to walk with them. Mm. So I'm so happy that we're shedding light on this important topic today. Friends, our mission is to give you hope and perspective, and that means that we sometimes have to take a hard look at things that seem hopeless. And it's really easy to feel that way about abuse in the church when day after day there are headlines of those in Christian leadership who are using their power to harm others, sometimes other Christian leaders. And often they're covering it up and denying it. Today, we're going to shed some light on it. Yeah, I mean... If we were to open the chat and have everybody share, we would all have stories of where we're connected by a degree or two by this abuse in the church. The a college near me has decided to close their doors after covering up a pretty big scandal. And one headline that grabbed my attention recently was this, confidence in American institutions, including the church, drops to historic lows. There's probably lots of factors for that. But what does it mean for us as followers of Jesus? That's who we are here on Grounded. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for the world that desperately needs Jesus when we no longer feel like the church is a safe place? Yeah. And I I, want to say something. You might be thinking, this doesn't have anything to do with me. Mm. You're wrong. This touches all of us. Because I believe we cannot fulfill the call of the Great Commission and turn a blind eye to what's happening in the body of Christ. We've simply got to be a part of the solution. So in this episode, we want to focus on how how do we care for those who've been harmed by their Christian leaders. Diane Langberg is with us. She's worked in the trenches of the lives of many people impacted by abuse, and she's going to equip us to join her in that fight. I'm glad you said that, Dana. You might be thinking, not my church. I promise you, there are abused individuals in the pews of your church. And we also ought not have the attitude that it cannot happen in our churches, uh, as I'm sure we'll get into in this episode. This is an important episode. It's a weighty episode. It's a heavy episode. But that doesn't mean it's not important. I would call it critical. I put it in the critical category. Yeah. And it's one that we're going to encourage you to share because we believe that's true. So share it with those you know. Dana mentioned she has walked with some friends. Maybe you have two. Share with those you know have been harmed and share it with the leaders of your own church. That is actually a gift that you can give them to help them be equipped, because I promise you, they are thinking about this, praying about it, and facing it on various levels. Robin and Ray McKelvey are also with us today. You know them. You love them. They're Christian leaders. Ray's a pastor. Robin is an author, a Bible teacher, a mom, a grandma, and they're going to share their very honest heart about their own lives, how this impacts their own lives, and how they're responding as church leaders. Mm -hmm. I I can't remember the last time I felt so excited about the conversation we were going to have, although Mm. I'm also a little bit fearful today because you and I both know there's going to be some landmines in this conversation, Mm. a lot of them. And this is normally the place where we share good news, but I just want to say in a single sentence, this is the good news. Jesus can heal the pain of of abuse. Amen. I've had a front row seat to see it. I know that it's true. In place of our good news segment this morning, I'm going to ask our co-host Portia to actually pray over you and for us as this conversation unfolds. Portia, would you pray for us? Absolutely. I would I would be glad to. Um, before we pray, I would ask all of you at home and wherever you are, if you can take a posture of humility, whether that's bowing or kneeling, 
um, I ask that you do that right now as we go to the Lord. So let us pray. Father, Lord, we pray for your divine guidance in this conversation. Um, help us to navigate this uh, in a way that is clear, uh, but also compassionate and also not lacking in, in conviction. Mm -hmm. um, help us to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Help us to know how to care for the abused and not even just the abused, but also teach us and help us to know how to respond to the abuser, um, mm. both in ways that reflect that we are truly follow followers of Christ and not of the world. Lord, we ask that you will equip us to be the church, that distinctive set apart bride that you have called us to be. And Father, we are thankful for your grace. And even in the midst of situations like church abuse, we rest in your ability to redeem and to present your bride without spot or wrinkle. And so, Father, we thank you. Um, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Portia. It's time to get right to our conversation. Um, and today's guest is one we have wanted to secure for a long, long time. She's been at the top of our wish list because she's a leading expert in on abuse within the church and how to respond to it. In fact, I have a friend who has experienced absolutely horrific abuse. In many ways, abuse makes you lose your mind. Well, my friend has mentioned the name of today's guest over and over to me. Why? Because in her words, Dr. Diane Langberg has given me my brain back. I bet you know someone who's experienced abuse within the church. Maybe she feels like she's losing her mind. For the sake of that friend, I beg you, will you stay with us for this important conversation? I don't think that I have led a more important interview this year than the one you're gonna hear in just a moment. Dr. Diane Langberg is a Christian psychologist. She is globally recognized for her clinical work with trauma victims. Dr. Langberg, welcome, and thank you so much for helping my friend. You're welcome, and it's a privilege to be here. Hey, I want to start with um, just how big is the problem? You, you actually said, quote, trauma is the mission field of the 21st century. Can you explain that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> if you just look at it from the perspective of sexual abuse, let's say in the United States, the statistics say one in four women, one in six men have been sexually abused before the age of 18. Wow. So you take those numbers and put them in the pews where you go to church. And of course, trauma is certainly broader than child sexual abuse. It includes rape, it includes domestic violence, it includes war um, and, and other things. And so there are many, many people who've experienced trauma who we sit next to, sing songs with, and don't know. Yeah. Um, what caused you to decide, because you were, you were practicing other types of, of mental health and wellness care, but you decided to just make this your specialty. What, what, what did you see unfolding that caused you to do that? <laughs> Actually, I didn't decide. <laughs> I think God decided. Uh, I started out in the early 1970s with a master's working on my doctorate. So that's 50 years ago I started. And somewhere in the first year, a young woman came to see me and she had long hair and she threw it across her face so I couldn't see her. Mm. And she said to me, my father used to do weird things to me. Mm. I had absolutely no idea what she was talking about. Nobody talked about abuse. Trauma was not a clinical word. Post-traumatic stress disorder was not a clinical category until 1980. This was 1973. I was told by a supervisor not to believe her because women tell hysterical stories and if I had believed her, I would contribute to her pathology. So being one of the lone females around, women asked to see me 
certainly not because I knew anything. I was just starting out. And I began to hear other stories like that and decided to believe the women then out the supervisor. Wow, so good for you. So it wasn't a decision. It happened, I believe, that God was in it. And I have followed him into this jungle, frankly, with yeah. all kinds of things I never knew existed uh, being brought into things that break your heart and his. Thank you so much for obeying him in that call. Um, it's fast forward now to 2022. Why does it matter that we in the church are equipped to respond to the problem of trauma right now? Why does it matter today? Well, it's always mattered. But uh, number one, it is a much more public thing. And so you are much more likely to have people in a church who will at some point to somebody say something that indicates that they have been traumatized in some fashion. And the numbers, which I've just given, I mean, if you have one in four women, you count off the women in your church. You know, that, that's about how many, uh, one in six men. And, and you never think about that on a, on a Sunday morning. But the bottom line is we follow and are called to be like a suffering savior. Mm. You'll never meet a human with a wound whose wound he hasn't borne. He's mm. carried them all. And he's called us to walk with him in that place. Mm. And if we don't, we're disobedient to him. Obviously, we hurt and damage suffering people. But we follow a suffering, wounded savior and he takes us into the wounds of the world mm. and asks us to go and to bring him into that place. I love that. What a beautiful, and I'm thinking of the scripture that says that when we minister to the least of these, we're really ministering to Jesus himself. And so um, you've kind of answered a question that's been rolling around in my head this morning, but why is this issue? Uh, unique within the church? Why does it has to have to be responded to in a different way by those of us who follow Jesus Christ? Well, partly we have a history of ignoring such things, not just as being a reality in the world, but we have ignored and covered up abuse that has occurred in a church, often by someone in a leadership or shepherding position. And so we have not turned on the light. We have not uh, spoken the truth about these things. We have been deceived and we have chosen that deception as well. So we, the people of God, are disobedient to God mm -hmm. if we fail to see this and respond to it. Mm. When a shepherd is the one, the pastor, the Christian counselor within the church, when someone who's shepherding them is the uh, abuser, does that do a different kind of damage to an individual? Yes. Um, if your father is your abuser, that's different than if some strange man did it. There's a weight that a person yeah. such as a father or a pastor or leader uh, has that it becomes part of that burden and the damage that it makes. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about abuse of power. As I listen to women dialoguing about this and trying to decide how they respond, um, I, I see that when sometimes they'll say, well, she's an adult. I'm speaking, of course, of an adult woman in a sexually abusive relationship with an adult male leader. Let's say it's an adult male Christian leader. And sometimes I hear something that makes me really uncomfortable, and that is they'll say, well, she's an adult. This had to have been mutual. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. How do we know the difference? Can you talk to us about the power dynamic? Well, somebody in leadership of any kind, whether it's in the church or in a company or whatever, has power. And they have often many types of power. And so uh, they have verbal power. Their words matter in a way that the ordinary person in the pew's words don't matter. They're the teacher. They're the leader. Uh, they speak for God if it's in a church. And so that carries a great deal of weight. 
Um, if it's somebody like a pastor or a caregiver of another kind, they are called by God to shepherd the lambs, which we all are. I don't care how many degrees you have, how old you are, how smart you are, anything else. You're a lamb and lambs need care and protection. And so anytime that happens, we're not only harming the individual, we're harming the whole body of Christ because we're all connected. And we're clearly harming God's name uh, in that place and that name in the world. So the destruction is huge. Yeah. And I think so many times I have seen organizations try to protect the organization rather than rush to protect the woman. Have you seen that? And what would you say to it? I guess it's actually very common. We protect the system of the church rather than the sheep. You don't have to read very far in the Gospels to understand that the value that, that Jesus placed was on the sheep not on the system. I mean, th this is a Lord who went into the temple, which was a system designed by God for the people of God. Sounds like a church. And yeah. he called it a den of robbers, which literally means a safe place for those who steal. Mm. And he cracked whips and turned tables over because it was utterly not representative of the character of God. And that hasn't changed. But we, I think, are easily seduced into protecting and even worshiping our systems. But the system that the scripture teaches is not a building or uh, a ministry or anything like that. The system that scripture teaches is a body, a body of living human beings who are called to follow their head. It's an organic thing. It's not a place. It's not uh, something that has rules and sets everything up and takes care. Those can be things that are used for that living body, but they are not the body and they are not to be protected, which they were not in either the Old or the New Testament by God, when they are full of rot that destroys sheep. Yeah, yeah. Amen. I'm thinking of that passage where, you know, rather than protecting the entire flock, Jesus goes after that one lost sheep. And yes. how much more do we need to go after that one lost, lone, damaged, wounded, hurt sheep? Um, in fact, let's go ahead and begin to speak to that woman who says, I'm that sheep. I'm lost, I feel lonely, and I have been deeply damaged. Maybe the abuse happened in the church. Maybe it happened in her family. Maybe it was years and years, decades ago. Uh, maybe it happened in her workplace. The statistics tell me that there's a woman listening right now who is being or has been abused and just doesn't know what to do about it. Would you talk to her? What's the first step she needs to take to begin the work of healing? Well, in some ways, she already took the worst first step if she says, I have been abused. Mm. That's the first step. Number wow. one, even if you just say it to yourself, let alone somebody else, it takes courage to do that. And second of all, it's truth. Not only were you abused, but by saying that you were abused, you're recognizing that something was done to you that was not good, not right. Yeah. You know, you're not just putting 100% of the blame on yourself, which is what so many victims do. You know, if I hadn't walked down that street, it wouldn't have happened, as if somehow that was then their fault. Um, so she, she's already taken the first step. The second step is to be careful and find a safe place where you can sit with somebody who knows something about abuse and understands it and will walk with you. They won't lecture you. They won't give you three things to do over the next week. They won't do any of those things, but they will listen and walk with you so that you can find strength and courage to face it and healing as you do. That's beautiful. I love that you're saying listen, because that means that though I don't have any training 
though I don't have a ton of experience walking with women who've experienced abuse, I can listen. That is something I know how to do. And so that gives me hope as someone who can be a healer. Um, let's talk about hope. Is there hope for a woman who's experienced abuse to really heal? I mean, really, really be well again. Can you tell us the story of someone um, anonymously, of course, that you have watched heal? Well, I have watched many women and men heal. Um, it is a slow, hard process. Um, it requires courage and uh, just determination to go forward um, when it hurts so much and you want to stop and you just want it to go away. But I have watched men and women face the truth of what happened, begin to understand the truth about what happened, and also begin to name what it has done to them, and begin to take steps that are healing for them, now, which is different for every individual. Um, but I have seen men and women who then, first of all, get some sense that God is not an abuser. This was not his idea. He didn't yes. sanction it. Oh, he loves wow. them. And yes. he bears the scars of the abuse that was done to them. Because that's mm. part of what he carried on the cross. Mm. And they also mm. realize, they begin to realize that he gave them gifts. He gave, the, he gave them strengths. They wouldn't be talking about it if he hadn't done that, number one. But two, he's given them gifts that will bring beauty into this world, will help other people, will strengthen others, and that they are worthy of those and worthy to use them. So that there are many, I don't, you know, an example is difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me talk to you also if you have experienced ways. Right, right. Let me talk to you if you have experienced abuse and suggest that, um, first of all, let me tell you words that you probably need to hear. It wasn't your fault. Did you hear Dr. Dan, Diane Langberg just say that? It was not your fault. And let me encourage you to find a person, pray, ask the Lord's wisdom, but find someone who you believe is safe and begin to tell your story. I really think that that's gonna take you a long way in getting on the trajectory to experience healing. And it is gonna be a long journey. Um, you, you're probably feeling physical effects in your body that you don't even know are a part of the abuse. Dr. Diane Langberg, expects speak to that for just a moment. Um, this, as, as I have counseled with friends, a lot of times, sometimes they'll have sicknesses, joint pain or ailments that they didn't ever realize were associated with their body holding the shame and the pain of this abuse. And when they started therapy, when they started counseling, when they started healing, suddenly these physical maladies started to quiet down. Is there a connection? Well, there's certainly not a 100% connection, but absolutely there is. I mean, abuse happens to a body. Yeah. You know, it, it happens to a mind, it happens to the heart in terms of emotions and things, but it happens to a body. And there are often, particularly if it's ongoing abuse, uh, you know, chemicals in the body that are reacting to what's going on, to the fear and the harm and everything else yeah. that hurt the body. And yeah. learning how to take care of the body as you deal with the abuse, how to bring beauty into your life, how to bring quietness to the body, um, and let it be safe for the first time. Uh, it can be very healing, but it's hard work and it can be slow, um, but it happens. It does happen. I've seen it happen in some of my friends' lives. Um, I want to also encourage that uh, there's there's a lot of room for someone with um, some some level of clinical expertise to help you because it is such a complex process. And then there's room for your friends to be the listening ears. But don't you think that a woman who's experienced trauma probably needs both? Um, yes, absolutely. And I would have to say, I think back to one situation was a very complicated situation with years and years and years of abuse uh, in a woman's life. And she was, became willing, which was extremely courageous, to allow three women from her church to walk with her in that process. 
and gave permission for them to come and meet with me. And so we did, and we talked through abuse and what it does and what to expect and how to respond. And those women did that for several years. They walked with wow, this woman. That, mm. And they came back to me later to say how much they had changed. I mean, so it's she, but she wasn't the only one. <laughs> they had changed in many, many ways. Isn't that a beautiful testimony to how God is always working on all of us? I feel like I've said wow a lot in this interview, and that that is not usually a word that's in Dana Gresh's vocabulary, but there is a strength, a gentleness, and a wisdom in you that is profound. So thank you, Dr. Langberg, for being with us today. Dr. Langberg is the author of many books. I want to recommend Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church. Um, Dr. Langberg, can you tell us who should read this book and why? <laughs> well, I suppose it'll sound a little egocentric, but I think everybody in the church should read it <laughs> because we have so uh, supported and honored and and uh, held in high high places the power that human beings have in the church. You know, they're the godly one. They're the this. They're just sheep too. Mm. There is only one shepherd. Mm. And as we as there's power of voice and the use of money and the use of platform and the use of being able to say who you are and how worthy you are and everything else is laid on human beings, they go awry. It's not their position. Their yeah. position is to be an under shepherd, which means everything that an under shepherd does comes directly from the shepherd. Yeah. Not from their personal needs, not from their desires, not from their need of power, whatever. And I think much of the body of the church does not recognize not only how power has been abused in the church, but how often the way we do our systems, we have made that happen, or at least encouraged it. So I think it helps clarify some of that. Wonderful. Dr. Diane Langberg, thank you for being with us today on Grounded. You're welcome. That book again is titled Redeeming Power, Understanding Authority and Abuse in the Church by Dr. Diane Langberg. You know, one of the things we haven't done great at as God's people in response to the reality that brokenness exists inside the church is to listen well. You just heard her say that. It's so important. We had Cheryl Marshall and Caroline Newhauser on Groundhouse earlier, on Grounded earlier this year, and we shared a powerful reminder about the wisdom in listening quietly. Let's watch. One of the things a wise woman knows to do is when to just be quiet. That takes, again, self-control and wisdom. Of course, in those really difficult times, those are the times to remember that this is a time for me to listen. This may be a time for me to cry with my friend, to just identify with her and her suffering. And it takes wisdom to know how long to be quiet and then yeah. when to actually speak into her life. And so sometimes it just even requires saying, can I share with you what the Lord is laying upon my heart or teaching me from his word to give us hope in this situation? Sometimes you have to ask for passports yeah. into their life to speak, and ask for especially if you're unsure. That. What do our churches need to minister to the abused well? And how are they seemingly, how are these seemingly nonstop headlines about scandals involving church leadership impacting those who have dedicated their lives to serving the local church? Well, we don't know anyone better to tell you that story than our own Ray and Robin McKelvey. So take it away, friends. Thank you, Portia. Um, we are so happy to be here on such yes. a dynamic and important topic. And both of us, I don't know if they had the mics on, they probably didn't, but we're like, whoa, that's deep. Mm. Yes because Diane Langberg is our new best friend. <laughs> she was amazing in telling the truth and the yeah. truth needs to be told in our churches. And ladies, you get to hear from me all the time. So today I'm not gonna say much. I'm gonna allow Ray to just share 
as leadership in many churches, the Lord has had him be a part of many churches, and he's been on the leadership team of those churches, we need to also hear from the leaders. And so, Ray, I want to ask you this first question. How are the seemingly nonstop headlines, and you know we read them all the time, right. about the scandals involving church leadership um, impacting those who have dedicated their lives to the local church? Well, I mean, I, first off, I want to just say Grounded Family, it is just a privilege to be a part of what's happening. I'm very sober. Uh, being a pastor myself, obviously being in leadership, and want to applaud Do Dr. Diane as she was speaking. And I know that I, I could go a hundred different directions with this topic, knowing that abuse happens from the top down. I have seen it. I've experienced it in my own life. Uh, when I was in college, uh, we had uh, one of my college professors uh, start a church, and he asked me to be a, a part of his church plant, and I was so excited. And I remembered him telling me, hey, I want to disciple you. I want to uh, give you practical training on everything that's happening in the church. And so I would go on visitations with him. I would go to workshops with him. I was very involved in his church plant. I led worship, taught Sunday school, and even my one of my first sermons was preached in his church. But little did I know, this dynamic pastor was abusing women in the church. And when it came out, I remember being devastated. And that was, you know, over 40 years ago. And I still feel the pain of that and get emotional when I think about this man that I respected, loved, revered and realized that he was abusing uh, God's sheep. And so the impact is profound uh, on, on people. It, it, it is very discouraging and disheartening, disillusionment. And we hear a lot about people deconstructing their faith. And I think there are other reasons for that, but I can tell you so many people are struggling with this because of what's happening to God's people by shepherds. And I just want to read something from Ezekiel 34. I hadn't planned on reading this, but it's here. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with wool, you slaughter the fat one, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, with the force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And I can tell you that passage is so relatable to what's happening in the church here in America. I have so many uh, people that I can tell you over and over, they will ask me, could you pastor me? People that don't go to my church that are long distance that will email and say, I don't have a shepherd. And I can tell you, uh, the reason that we're seeing this epidemic happen is because we have we've bought into the celebrity pastor syndrome. We as churches want men uh, who can draw in a crowd. Uh, we don't really care about character. And I would agree with Ted Tripp or Paul Tripp. He has a book called Lead, and he talks about the problem that's happening is that our pastors are not part of a healthy leadership community. And the abuse happens, it will continue to happen if pastors aren't in a community of people who will love them, hold them accountable, people who will care for their pastors. And I can tell you, being in the ministry for over 35 years now, it, it's so sobering to realize that God has called us as his leaders to love his people. Uh, and to care for them. But Ezekiel 34 uh, opens our eyes to the fact that we as shepherds need to care for God's sheep. And I, I 
even am struggling as we have this um, uh, podcast now because I'm thinking as a pastor, I represent uh, what you're talking about today. And I, you know, thank God I have never walked down that path. But for any woman who has been abused, I am so sorry and apologize for the many men who exercise power and abuse, uh, but don't have a heart for the sheep. And my heart aches for that, for you and for anyone who's gone through that. And I don't know, Rob, I know I've just gone off into another direction, but I just know as a pastor, my heart bleeds for the church or the body of Christ. And so I, I, I would say this, we need to call our pastors back to, and call our leadership back to what God has called us to, and that is to love and feed and care for his sheep. And it's not the celebrity that we should be looking for. So. Amen. I'll just say amen to that. And then I'll say, Aaron, come on and teach us how to be grounded in this element in God's word. Mm, well, Ray, I put you in that category of you pastoring me from a distance. I have Pastor Chris and Pastor Justin here where I attend church. But man, I, there are women watching this who have never heard a pastor express grief over this. Really, it's a it's an epidemic. We all know what that word means now. Yes. Um, and they've never heard a pastor be sorry and sad um, and humble. And what a move towards healing you've taken us in. So thank you. Thank you. It would be silly for me to, to say it's now time to get grounded in God's word. We have been grounded in God's word this whole episode, and rightly so. A lump in my throat. Um, but let's stay grounded in God's word. Twice that I could think of. I have been the one that a woman who had been sexually assaulted came to tell first, twice. Uh, and for the first time, I was a teenager hearing that from a fellow teenager. And the second time, I was serving my husband in student ministry. And I wrestled with what to say this morning. I wanted to say something safe, but this is not the time for safety, and so I will be honest, and I want to admit something today that I've never before admitted, and the reason that I'm admitting it is to call us to walk in humility from this episode forth. I'm not proud of these memories. They were way back in the back of my Abdullah Oblongata or wherever my brain uh, stores memories, because in both cases, my instinct, my first response was to draw back and to give in to insecurity. And my first response in both cases was, God, forgive me, even to wonder if the woman sitting across from me was telling the truth, even though I had every reason to believe that she was. But if you've ever seen a woman, the first time she tells the story of her abuse, you know that that story meanders and she doubts herself. You know that it's not a story told with confidence or clarity. Often, and I don't know if my uncertainty sh showed on my face, and I can't remember what I said, but I've often wondered this. Did those two women ever find the courage to tell somebody else after they told me? I was the first responder, and I blew it. In doing so, did I inadvertently communicate that it was best for those women to keep their secret in some dark, dark corner and never tell anyone again. Diane wrote in an article that inspired this segment called Listening to God's Voice to Silence Trauma. We're going to drop the link to that. But she said this, Jesus had a passion for redeeming, for those who have been abused and are suffering from the, its debilitating after effects. Listen hard. There is hope for you. Hope for healing and transformation, I know. I come to you from the front lines and have seen it happen countless times. It takes courage, hard work, and there is no quick fix. Listen to this. Such redemption was Jesus' master passion. His master passion. 
was to mend broken things. It is to mend broken things. It is to restore what has been taken by the hand of evil. It is to bring life where before him and apart from him, there can only ever be death. So where do we ground ourselves in God's word today? I want you to listen to Luke chapter 10, 33 through 35. I'm reading from the NLT. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, if you know this story, this was the man uh, thrown aside on the side of the road, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay it the next time that I'm here. Listen to that story anew with Christ's master passion for redemption in your mind. And zero in on that word, compassion. We said it at the top of this episode, and I'll say it again. There are many landmines in the story of a woman who's been abused. There are many landmines in the story of our churches and the fact that abuse has infiltrated there and is being perpetuated there and is being covered up there. But a compassionate response is a Christ-like response. Consider Matthew 9.36. I thought of this as Ray was talking. Here it is in the ESV. When he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Listen, Diane and Ray and I did not put our heads together before this episode and decide we were all going to talk about sheep and shepherds. None of us knew that the rest of us were going to talk about it. But the Lord knew. He is the master shepherd. And how does he respond to his sheep? With compassion. There are many in our midst, women and men and children, who are harassed and helpless. Their stories are complex. And my encouragement to us this morning is simple, but it is rarely easy. May we respond with compassion. And like the Good Samaritan, may we cross over. May we cross over ready to care for those who are wounded at our own expense. It will cost you to move towards the friend in the ditch who is bleeding out because of the abuse that has been perpetuated on her life. It will cost you. But cross over and pay it because of what Christ has done for you. And if, like me, you've had a chance to help in the past and you blew it, today's a new day. Let's try again. I know we've prayed a lot, but I'm going to pray again. Jesus, thank you that when you look upon the church in this day, you see our true state. We are harassed and helpless. We harass and help our we harass our own flock. But we are not without a shepherd. So I can praise you that in this day when I am alive, you are shaking the church to her foundation. You are revealing the abused and the abusers, not just to expose things so we can stare at them, but so that you can cleanse the temple. So help every person who has ears and is hearing me talk right now. Be moved with compassion and cross over. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. You are probably feeling sobered by this episode of Grounded. I want to tell you something. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. God has given us our emotions. They serve as messengers Mm -hmm. And abuse in the church breaks the heart of God. It should break yours too. But I want to suggest something. Maybe yours is hurting because God is calling you to action. He has something specific that he wants you to do to fill a position in the army of believers. That's what it's going to take, an army of us, to fix this problem in the walls of the church. And I, I'm going to correct myself or let the Holy Spirit correct me because 
There are no walls in the church. You heard Dr. Diane Leinberg today say, Mm -hmm. it's not an institution, it's the people. We are the church, and we've got to be a part of the solution. To that end, let me encourage you to visit Dr. Diane Langberg's website. It's packed full of tools that I think will really help you help a hurting friend, maybe train your church or your ministry team to identify abuse and respond to it. Um, it. It'll help equip you to understand how to take action when you yourself are the one who is the victim. Here are some of the resources you're going to find. Um, you're going to find articles written by Diane herself. You're going to find training videos for your mm-hmm. church from Diane and so much more. We'll drop a link, but you can visit that at dianelangberg.com. Absolutely. Um, we also want to provide you with some resources from our website right here on the Revive Our Hearts blog. And we have a blog entitled How to Make the Church a Safe Place for the Abused. And this is from uh, Kimberly Wagner. It is an excellent blog post, very practical. Um, and I love that she points to other resources or tools that could be used um, to better equip the church to respond to uh, this type of de- devastation. Well, here we are at the end of the episode. And I think what we said at the top has come to be true. Mm. This is surely one of the most important episodes of Ground that we've ever recorded. Yeah. To that end, I want to beg you to do two things. Learn and listen. Mm. I think, Absolutely. thank you, Aaron, so much for your your humble and transparent confession. We've all been in that place where we've mm-hmm. been the first responder who blew it. And what we know is that we have a lot to learn. Yeah. <laughs> so reach out for some of these resources because as we learn and as we grow, not only are we going to know how to respond the next time, but you heard Diane Leinberg say, it will change us. The Lord will use it in our mm-hmm. sanctifying process. Mm-hmm. And then listen. I beg you to be a listener, to learn to be a listener. We are not very good at that in the United mm-hmm. States of America. Some other countries are a little better at it. We kind of stink at it. Mm-hmm. Listening is the greatest tool we can bring. After 25, almost 30 years of ministering to teenagers and college-age women, I have had the opportunity to sit with a lot of them and learn But I have also discovered that I'm not a clinician. I'm not a Christian psychologist, nor do I need to pretend to be. Hmm. Sometimes I can help a woman in whatever issue she brings to me, but lots of times I need to triage her needs and get her in the help of someone who's more qualified, who understands the delicacies of trauma and abuse. Hmm. So listen and learn. Hmm. Learn and listen. Those are your marching orders today Mm -hmm. after this wonderful episode of Grounded. And I encourage you, if you think it's as valuable as we do, would you share this episode? Because we think there are not enough people in the body of Christ saying some of the brave things Mm -hmm. that you heard spoken today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so easy to stick your head under a rock and just act like this isn't happening, but this is a reality for the church. And as believers, we have a responsibility to mm-hmm. bear this burden together, to figure mm-hmm. this out, of course, with the help of the Lord. Uh, but yeah, so today I think my posture of heart has really been listening and learning and allowing God to equip me and help me to know how to respond in these situations. So I haven't even wanted to talk much because I'm just mm-hmm. like soaking it all in. Mm-hmm. Yep. Aaron, well, do you I, have any? Aaron, do you have any I'm final sorry. thoughts as we finish up today? I don't. I still have a legitimate lump in my throat. And uh, we've been excited to do this episode, which sounds strange, but that's because we've had hope that on the other end of it, mm-hmm. some people are going to, some women are going to experience freedom. Some people are going to turn away from sin. Somebody's going to tell. So I'm thinking about you, if that's you. And um, I'm, I'm eager to hear what the Lord does next in your life. Amen. 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 Well, next week, we will be joined by Janny Ortland, and we're going to be talking about building a spiritual legacy. And so you don't want to miss it. I encourage you to join us back here next week. Let's wake up with hope 
together next week on Grounded.